um, and I'll, I'll try and make this worthwhile. So the idea for th this talk is to look at some emerging patterns and emerging tools that I think are going to change the landscape of what we do with automated testing over the next 10 years. So uh, a lot of this is going to be kind of blue sky predictions. I've, you know, I, I might come through, might not come through. Um, you can't sue me if none of this comes true later, but uh, most of what I'll talk about, you can actually do even today if you don't mind a bit of kind of sticky tape and glue and putting things together. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at the emerging trends that are coming out. So in terms of kind of where we are today, especially with kind of all testing and things that I think last probably five or six years have been a lot of kind of like free lunch for developers where things have been relatively easy. Um, I read a joke uh, a year ago about what developers use operating systems for, and it said something like, most developers use OSX for development, they use Linux for hosting, and they use Windows to test an Internet Explorer. And kind of for, for a lot of people I work with, certainly that's true because kind of most of the platforms, especially if you're going to do web or something like that, well, you know, you can develop in Chrome on pretty much anything. It has good development tools. You give it a bit of a test in Firefox and a bit of a test on Windows in Internet Explorer, and then it's okay. But kind of, I remember what it was like in 1999 where there was, I don't know, Netscape 3 and Internet Explorer 3, and there was kind of zero compatibility between them. And either I'm stupid or this thing doesn't work. It's so, um, and I think the situation is going to be very, very similar to, to that and 10 times worse soon. Um, about two months ago, we got a bug report for a web app that I'm developing and somebody was complaining that it doesn't work on their Samsung fridge. Okay. It's never intended to work on your Samsung fridge. You should use a fridge to store vegetables and stuff like that. You know, it's kind of, but you know, this guy was insisting that it's really, really important for him to look at, you know, the, the fridge and do this stuff. And um, one of the trends that's really going to start hitting us badly soon is fragmentation. If you ever try to do anything on an Android device over the last two or three years, that's horrible, that's bad. But it's nowhere near how bad it's going to be in five years' time. Um, the research agency Gartner estimates that at this very moment, there's about 4.9 billion thingies connected to the internet. And their estimate is that by 2020, there's going to be about 20 billion of those thingies. Some of them will be Samsung fridges. Some of them will be computers. But, you know, there's going to be a Japanese toilet that somebody tried to use her up on, and then it kind of started flushing like mad. And um, the, the, another research agency called ABI Research estimates that that number is going to be twice that, so about 40 billion thingies on the internet. And the fragmentation there is going to be insane. I, th I think kind of, you know, most of the apps at, the, at this point run on mobile phones or on websites, on, on computers, where we're going to be seeing less and less of that. And that's going to start creating some really interesting challenges for what we need to do to test stuff. Um, the other really interesting trend that's kind of coming up is a push from reliable hardware where people have invested a lot of cash, they've invested people to kind of maintain it to something that runs who knows where in the cloud. And kind of that's been coming again for the last six or seven years, but IDC estimates that by the end of 2017, about 65% of organizations are going to have at least part of their infrastructure running in the cloud. S something is going to happen there. And that's moving from something where, you know, it's rock solid, it's bulletproof, you can pretty much trust your hardware to stuff where you have absolutely no idea what it's working on. It's probably going to die 10 times as your function executes on it, and it's going to be more and more kind of diverse. It's going to be more and more outside of our control. Um, Amazon has done some really interesting stuff with their Lambda 
kind of processing and Google has now kind of released a competitor to that. I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that where we, we you know, as a developer, you even have no awareness of whether that's executing in one virtual machine, 20 virtual machines. You have no control over that. You have no control whether when it's starting or stopping and things like that. That's going to change some really, really kind of fundamental ways of how we think about software and what we need to test because it introduces some completely new assumptions there. The, the third big push that I think is happening is the push towards front end, where 10 years ago, I think the bulk of software was kind of executing somewhere in the back, where most people were designing their apps that most of the logic is running on a server, running in the back, and kind of the stuff that's in the browser is teeny tiny. You just need to kind of do a bit of testing there to make sure it's all connected correctly. There's virtually zero risk in that. Where with the fragmentation, with kind of mobile devices, with smart fridges, with a ton of other stuff, the risk is significantly shifting towards the front end. And that's changing the whole kind of risk profile around testing and things like that. So those are three, some, th those are three really, really interesting trends that are coming and they're going to hurt quite a lot when it comes to testing because all of them are complicating testing significantly. Now, in order to make this sustainable, we will need to automate more and more and automate it differently. And that creates a really interesting challenge. Now, these trends that are coming up are not just kind of going to interrupt us and create problems. They also open up some really, really interesting opportunities. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today. So the first thing that they open up is a really interesting opportunity is switching and, and changing the balance of what's expected, what's unexpected. Um, a lot of testing today is kind of divided into expected and unexpected, where the expected stuff is the happy path, how we kind of expect stuff to work. And then, oh, there's a bit of exploratory testing. Let's check these kind of weird values. And I think we're going to start getting into more and more problems with fragmentation with devices like that. The, a year ago, there was... Um, a case where typing HTTP colon with nothing after that pretty much broke Skype, so it's unrecoverable. You had to uninstall the Skype client and then install it again. Restarting didn't work. Um, there was a case with uh, Spotify uh, a year ago where somebody uh, used Unicode to trick their username verification because what they were doing is they were downcasing username. So if you try to register with capital A, lowercase b, s, it would kind of lowercase everything. But they didn't do it that well because somebody got um, uh, some weird Unicode characters that would downcase into ASCII and was able to hijack accounts with that very easily by asking for a password reset after that. And kind of I think, you know, we, we're getting to the point where, okay, it's, you know, it's 2016. The fact that somebody has an umlaut in the name is not that unexpected. And most people today don't even test for that. There was um, a lady in the U.S. who was a vegetarian activist and decided to promote vegetarianism by changing her name to the domain name of her favorite non-government agency that was goveg.com. She broke five million systems there by having a dot in her name. Stuff like that's not unexpected anymore. And I think, you know, claiming that that's unexpected is just irresponsible. So um, even further, you know, the, 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 there's things like that are published. They're easily accessible. There's uh, Max Wolf published a list, a big list of naughty strings available on GitHub. There's 700 commonly problematic strings. Um, these things kind of typically are handled as, oh, let's do exploratory testing, but it's, it's expected, it's known. It's not something we can ignore. Um, I made a simple tool for Chrome where on right-click on any input field, you get kind of all these weird values where you can try them out. And we, we, we have, you know, the, the knowledge about these things is there. If you want to look for it, it's there. We can't claim it's unexpected anymore. The big problem why nobody's really doing automation on this stuff is it costs too much. Technically, we have the capability of running through the whole Maxwell's list for every input field in our app, seeing what's going to happen. Is it going to break or not? 
But if you want to do that on all the browsers, all the platforms, the risk is moving to the front end, on the fridge and everything, it just costs too much. Nobody's going to do that. Now, a really interesting thing that's kind of happening now with the cloud is the cost of doing that is significantly going down. There's this service already available called AWS Device Farm, where you can schedule a task and it will be executed on physical devices in parallel, on hundreds of physical devices. You can do different profiles. You're going to get summary results. So instead of having to kind of manually click on stuff, hey, you know, I want to run this on 200 different phones. Done. And this thing is dirt cheap. You no longer have to have your own device farms. You no longer have to have your own devices and everything. This thing does it for you. There are services that do similar things for browsers. For example, Browser Stack allows you to very quickly see how your website looks on all sorts of weird device and browser combinations. And you don't have to run the infrastructure. It's there for you. It kind of costs a bit of money, but hey, you know, that's not the end of the world. And now we're even seeing platforms that integrate this with testing. For example, Source Labs, you can run a Selenium test suite on over 700 combinations of browsers and platforms. It does it for you. Now, of course, it's not free to do that, but the cost of that compared to me running my own infrastructure for that scheduling tasks, organizing all that is going significantly down. And the more we get fragmented devices, the more people expect your stuff to run on a Samsung fridge, this thing is going to become more and more important. So kind of combining these things becomes really, really interesting because one, one thing I expect to see in the future are new services where we can now take a list of, you know, Max Wolf's list or one of the other heuristics and combine that with these kind of things and kind of start running that on lots of different platforms, lots of different devices, just to see, is it going to break? Is something weird going to happen with this? And my prediction is that over the next couple of years, as there's more competition there, the cost of these services is going to significantly drop. Because we are still, you know, compared to 2007, we're seeing the cost of cloud services dropping significantly, and this is going to go down. It's going to become relatively cheap to do this on every commit or every weekend or something like that, where the whole balance of what's expected, what's unexpected is going to change. And I think all those, you know, weird characters and long strings, short strings, uh, weird numbers and things like that, machines will be able to check most of that for us and see if something breaks. Now, of course, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that's going to replace human intelligence. Somebody still needs to come up with these cases, but once they become known, it's no longer that important that a human verifies that. So that's going to enable us to scale better. But we will still have humans involved in kind of deciding what to do. We'll still have humans involved in more important stuff that machines can't do for us. And that's where another class of services that's kind of coming in is really, really interesting because kind of there's... Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example, that allows you to schedule a task to be done by real people relatively cheaply. You can say, oh, I want 10,000 people to go and do this stuff. Or I want, you know, three people from India, three people from the UK, three people from Mexico, three people from Peru to kind of do this stuff just to see if there's a difference culturally how people are going to react. And that's becoming relatively easy and relatively cheap. Now, this service has been there for a while, and there are even kind of testing services where people promise, oh, you know, we're going to give you outsourced testing. Now, I I'm not a believer in outsourced testing. I don't think that works. Kind of that's mostly people who are trying to go through a script that somebody else created that's automatable. But there's a lot of value in human insight. There's a lot of value in people who have knowledge about doing stuff, doing that. I'll talk, you know... Well, I'll talk later where I see kind of that moving. But th there are some more, I, so I don't believe that kind of you'll be able to, although th there are all these services that are going to provision a thousand testers to do something for you, you're not going to get much that kind of a shell script won't be able to do. But there are some really, really interesting combinations with this stuff. For example, user testing is a service that brings real actual users to your site. 
not, not testers, but they bring users to the site and then they record the video of what people are doing to see how easy it is to onboard, to start using the app, to do something. So you can give them tasks where you can start doing usability testing in the cloud effectively. Um, so it's not going to be very, very smart usability testing, but most of usability problems are kind of detectable by what the user UX community calls hallway testing, where you can catch five random people in a hallway and see if they can't use the site, that pretty much means it's not any good. And kind of things like that, I think are going to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I, I, I've learned a lot by observing users trying to use our sites and currently with this collaboration tool I'm working on, we try to get people from Twitter, Google+, Facebook to kind of volunteer to do a 10-15 minute sh screen share session or I bring my laptop to conferences and do that kind of stuff. I think this will become a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do on the cloud in the future. So although we can now maybe afford to do usability testing with users once every month, things like this will be able to kind of do something like that every week or, or on every commit. There's a famous case of um, Google in 2009 uh, trying to kind of, the, the engineers were fighting a bit with the head of design who wanted to change the color of the links on the homepage, arguing that the, you know, if he comes up with a color that's more visible, people will click more on the links. And what the developers did that night is they have released 41 different shades of blue and measured and compared and then proved that, you know, the, the color that the head of design chose was actually performing about $200 million worse than the current one. Therefore, this wasn't applied. So, kind of, I think in, in the future we'll be able to do stuff like that, not on production, but kind of, you know, oh, you think people are going to click more? No problem. Here's a service, 10 minutes later, we measure whether people are clicking more or not. And it's going to help us drive some much better decisions. Now, kind of, the, I think the, 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 the big thing that's going to come out there is coordination. I think, you know, we, 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 today we have mechanical talk, we have user testing, we have a ton of other things but it's difficult to coordinate that, it's difficult to scale it. And my assumption is that over the next five years, we'll see more and more of tools that coordinate that kind of stuff. Something that's going to record 5,000 sessions and extract the important information for you to understand. So you don't have to watch 5,000 sessions manually. Or kind of stuff where we'll be able to say, my assumption is that people will click more on this link and then just kind of run that and CI fails the test or CI passes the test two minutes later or something like that. So I think th those kind of tools are going to become more and more interesting, cheaper, and, and we'll be able to use a lot more of those things. Now, the a second thing that's kind of really interesting there as a opportunity is we will be able to assist we will have tools that will be able to assist humans in making decisions. I've mentioned already that I don't think automation is ever going to replace humans because there's always going to be space for somebody kind of judging whether something is right or wrong, especially if it's not deterministic. And over the last five or six years, there's been a kind of slight increase, I'm not going to say a surge, but a slight increase in popularity of approval testing, especially for non-deterministic stuff. There's text test, which can run a test suite on your system, extract the valuable information from text logs, and then show it to you and say, is this okay? Because kind of the process is really complex and nobody really knows what it's going to output, but if the logs look okay, maybe that's fine. And then it uses that as a kind of baseline for future testing. So there's a bunch of similar tools like that that are emerging. And I think over the next five to 10 years, because of the whole fragmentation thing, because of cloud deployments, because there's going to be more and more unreliable stuff going on where we can't even predict all the assumptions, approval testing is going to become more important. Now, there's a really interesting um, game coming out soon that was crowdfunded uh, through Kickstarter and it's called No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky is incredibly important 
in terms of software development because of how they're approaching testing. No Man's Sky is a generative space exploration game. They have algorithms that generate space, planets, universes. The idea of the game is to have something like 18 quintillion planets that you can land on. And each of those planets is supposed to be playable for months and months and months. So there's no possible way for a human to go and test all that stuff. There's no possible way for a machine to go and test that stuff because there's no single definition of correctness there. And the way they're testing that is pretty much how NASA is testing space. What they've done is they've built probes that travel through the space, randomly jump to planets, explore that, and they film videos of what the probe sees. And then they show those videos on screens in the development room, and kind of the developers can watch something and say, oh, this is weird, this doesn't look right, and then kind of stop it, pause it, and then kind of adjust the algorithms. And this is really interesting because what they're trying to do is um, they are trying to create worlds that are semi-realistic that are grounded in physics, where, you know, the, the, the kind of animals tend to have heads and they tend to have legs and they tend to have a way to move or a way to fly and something that flies can't be too heavy, something that runs kind of it can be heavier and things like that. So they, they've, they've modeled a ton of birds and animals and things like that and then they put that into what they call a big box of math and this kind of for example, extends the neck of a giraffe or paints the lion slightly differently on every word or, or, or something like that. But th these things need to be grounded in reality. So there's no definition of correctness, but people can spot when something's completely off. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more tools that support testing like that for non-deterministic stuff, where currently it's completely impossible to automate any of that. But we'll be seeing tools that can automate that easily. For example, um, I've mentioned text test that's kind of an early precursor to this, but there's a tool developed by BBC called Wraith. What Wraith does is it uses a baseline screenshot of your website. When you change the code, it does the same screenshot, and it just outlines the differences. And it's up to you to say whether this is correct or not. Maybe you wanted to do this, maybe you didn't, but it very quickly points out the differences. And this allows them to kind of keep developing their websites and automate it in a way where they don't spend a ton of time describing what's expected because it's difficult to describe visual layouts as what's expected. Um, and there, there are some other interesting tools. For example, uh, Zebia Visual Review is kind of, again, pointing the differences where the original button was slightly larger. This one is now shorter. And then you can say, well, yes, I expected this to happen or Oh, this is unexpected. Let's kind of go and change it. And there are tools like DOM Reactor that allows you to kind of compare very easily how a website looks in multiple browsers side by side. So technically, these tools are already there. What we need to do is we need to kind of find ways of automating them better and automating them in a way that scales easier. And this is where kind of some emerging services like Apply tools are coming. Apply tools, for example, will run a Selenium or a protractor test suite with lots of different combinations. It will record the video and it will kind of point out the differences for you to review. And it makes the whole review process relatively easy. And again, I, you know, that's an emerging thing. I don't think we're there yet with these tools. There's another kind of interesting project that um, Jason Huggins developed. This is a Tapster bot. Tapster bot taps on a mobile device. The first version was done with Lego bricks and a iPad stylus. And now kind of, you know, you can get the design of this bot from GitHub and you can kind of 3D print it. And kind of this is going to allow us to kind of probe through the systems a lot easier and figure out where the differences are. Now imagine Tapster bot tapping on your application or the website then something like Apply Tools recording a video of that and something like Wraith or like uh, DOM Reactor or kind of these things that are already emerging, just showing, oh, here's a difference. Is this difference okay or not? 
And if it's okay, we'll use it as a baseline for future testing. If it's not okay, then, you know, go and change the code and rerun the test and we'll make it pass. So I, I think we'll be seeing lots and lots of kind of combinations of these things. So I think when we combine these kind of probing systems that are now emerging and we combine it with some kind of something that makes smart screenshots, we'll be starting to see lots and lots of kind of approval style testing that's becoming a lot easier, a lot cheaper, a lot more available, which then is going to solve a ton of problems that people have now where kind of, you can either not automate the UI or you can spend hours and hours and hours writing a test that you know is going to break as soon as somebody changes a link into a button. And it's going to be painful, painful to maintain and it's going to hurt. Kind of, this is going to make stuff a lot easier and a lot cheaper. So, kind of the next interesting opportunity that opens up there is evaluating stuff that we could not evaluate so far. Kind of, we don't have to go for approval tests. I think we'll be able to get even kind of expected tests, checking for expectations in lots of different ways. This is, for example, uh, Jim Shore's Quixote framework. Quixote is a unit testing framework for CSS. Nobody tests CSS in an automated way where what Quixote does is it allows people to express, given this style sheet, I expect this thing to be about 10 pixels from left side aligned to the right and things like that. So you, it evaluates the effects of that. And then what Jim does in his, let's call JavaScript screenshots, screencasts is he uses Karma to run this automatically in lots of different browsers. So he has cross-browser layout testing using CSS expectations unit level testing. And tools like this are emerging, for example, there's Galen framework, which uh, is used for layout expectation testing, where we can say, oh, we expect this to be above this and we expect this to be left or right, where kind of uh, responsive websites are, are a pain to do. They're, they're really a pain to do because of all the device and combinations. And they're a pain to do because there's no right or wrong way to kind of express the expectations. Galen framework allows us to do this, but the language they're using is, is kind of difficult to work with. It's technical, it's difficult for designers to use, and I think where this is going to start become really, really interesting is combine these two things, Galen framework and, and Quixote and kind of other emerging tools in this space with something like Pop-Up. Pop-Up is a prototyping app where People can just draw stuff on post-its or draw it on a whiteboard, take a photo, and then mark stuff as, oh, this is a button and this button leads there. This is kind of leading there. And it's, it's an incredibly fun and quick prototyping tool for mobile apps where they're actually expressing the flow through an app. Now, what I expect is going to happen over the next kind of five years is somebody's going to combine these two things. And we'll be able to kind of draw on a, post it or a napkin, the expected layout of an app. This is what it's going to look like on a mobile phone. This is what it's going to look like on a website. This is above this. This is left of this. And something's going to kind of combine those two things together. The technical ca capabilities are already there. It's just kind of the language that Galen uses, the language that Quixote uses is not designer friendly. And honestly, as a developer, I couldn't care less about something being one pixel left or right where designers obsess about that. So I think kind of these things combined will give designers tools to kind of evaluate layout. So kind of we'll have this probing thing that gives people differences. We'll have tools that evaluate layouts that are going to be kind of allow us to then say, well, you know, on a Samsung fridge, kind of this is displayed right next to the tomatoes and things like that. So kind of the, the, the next really interesting opportunity that comes up as, as kind of a result of all these things is that we'll be starting to, to be able to deal with things that are impossible to predict a lot easier. Uh, what, what I mean by that is the, the umlaut in the name is not unexpected. That's kind of expected. But there will still be outliers, there will still be completely unexpected things. We'll never resolve that because the technology is changing, the world is changing. In 2011, Mary Poppendick wrote a really nice article called The Tale of Two Airports. 
you should read it if you've not read that. And it's talking about the difference in the opening of Terminal 5 in London and Terminal 3 in Beijing. Where Terminal 5 in London famously opened to about 15,000 misplaced bags. And they had to ship all the bags to Italy to be sorted, send them back. There were massive delays. People sued them. Horrible experience. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Where Terminal 3 in Beijing opened up flawlessly. Everything worked on day one brilliantly. And Mary writes about how they were able to do that because before Terminal 3 in Beijing opened, they got the Chinese army to come in and do a stress test. They got 7,000 people to come in and said, you're going to be a terrorist. You're going to kind of lose your bags. You're a family that's kind of trying to figure out how to go from this terminal to this terminal. And they've made a statistically relevant sample with real people that tested the terminal. They've done it a couple of times. Hence, the whole thing opened flawlessly. Now, that's a really nice article, but it's not entirely true. Because there was a UK parliamentary investigation after the fact to figure out why there was such a massive cock-up. And it turns out that there were 66 simulations in Terminal 5 Heathrow. They had about 15,000 volunteers all together through those 66 simulations trying to use the terminal before it launched. But the problem is they were not looking for the right things. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter what we do with automated testing. Automated testing is always going to tell us whether the stuff we're looking for works or doesn't work. If we're not looking for it, we're not going to be able to get a kind of good result. But I think what's going to happen over the next five to ten years is we will have much better tools to deal with genuinely unexpected stuff. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is there's, there's an ongoing trend where companies are deploying their stuff to small percentages of users. Facebook is famous for releasing new versions of the software, new versions of features to 1% of the users, and then if nothing breaks, 10% of the users, and then if nothing breaks, releasing it globally. And Google is kind of doing similar stuff. Pretty much all the Google apps are released over three days throughout the world and things like that. So kind of that's done after the fact when people have already done as much testing as they could just to kind of make sure there's nothing really, really unexpected. And there's a ton of monitoring that's involved in that. And the monitoring services that kind of these people built internally are now emerging as third-party tools or kind of alternatives are emerging as third-party tools where we can catch unexpected stuff that we're not watching out for. For example, there's um, Hotjar that's a kind of Google Analytics on steroids that's doing heat maps, that's doing user journey tracking, that's doing a ton of other things you, you don't think about doing yourself. It's collecting all these metrics for you and it's doing kind of even recordings and funnels through the website so you can then analyze it after the fact and say well this is kind of not what i expected to happen and then dig deeper into what's going on um there's a, a ton of error and and kind of um exception tracking mechanisms now that emerged as as a result of the whole mobile landscape fragmentation where Pretty much, you know, all, all the mobile platforms can report errors back to Apple or Google, but now we're seeing tools that can do that for developers. Google Analytics integrated crash analytics for mobile. There are tools like Hotjar, that, that, there are tools like TrackJS that does that for kind of websites where they will catch all your errors, they will kind of package them nicely, send them back so you can analyze unexpected stuff. Now, kind of... This is mostly talking about error analytics and unexpected stuff, but what, what I think is going to happen is when we combine these things with behavioral analytics that we already have in Google and analytics and kind of stuff like Hotjar and kind of TrackJS and things like that, and we combine them with kind of things like uh, Apply tools that are going to record the sessions and kind of figure out what we do in testing and maybe Mechanical Turk or user testing that they're going to drive people to the website, we don't have to kind of release it to 1% of the users and hope to see what happens. Doing this before the actual deployment is going to become relatively cheap and statistically relevant. And I, I think we'll be seeing an emergence of tools like that. So I think 
what, what we'll start seeing more and more is kind of automated tests for behavior changes in production and kind of beha behavior changes pre-production and things like that where we're not going to know what we're looking for, but something is going to say, hey, your conversion rate was 5%, now it's 4 Something's going on. And here are the recordings, and here are all the logs. Or it's going to say, hey, um, this part of the website became a lot more popular for some reason. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. I mean, check it out. And you know, here's recordings, here are some heat maps, here's what the people have done to get there. And then you can figure out what's expected, what's unexpected about that. So um, then kind of the, the, the last trend that I think is really, really hitting uh, big recently is big data. Kind of big data is, you know, there's a, is a buzzword. It's all over the place. And um, it's no longer an IT buzzword. I think kind of the, the, the day big data really hit kind of globally was when Target in 2012, Target is a US retailer, Target in 2012 started sending um, kind of uh, nappies and, and baby food coupons to a girl in Minnesota. And um, th this was a 17 year old girl, her father got really angry and sh you know, he went there to start shouting at the Target employees, how on earth, you know, why on earth are they sending that to his daughter? And turns out the target was able to predict that she's pregnant even before she knew it, based on her buying patterns. Now, how and why, nobody knows. Kind of artificial intelligence hit mainstream. And we're seeing more and more of these things where Netflix is optimizing what videos to offer you based on some weird criteria that nobody knows. It's kind of a big box of AI doing that stuff with machine learning. Google is doing that for kind of search results. And that kind of technology up until recently was not really available to people unless you're Google, Facebook or somebody like that. Now, what's happened recently is that Google and their kind of researchers working on kind of the Google brain that's their AI system doing search optimizations released this kind of toolkit called TensorFlow. TensorFlow is an open source version of the Google Brain, which, you know, with enough hardware you can run on your own stuff. And now combine that with cheap cloud services, and hey, all of a sudden I can run my own machine learning. Microsoft released the deep learning tool, deep distributed machine learning toolkit that's kind of going in the same direction. We're seeing these toolkits emerging that are going to make machine learning available for people where, you know, it required millions and millions of dollars earlier and some really, really smart brains working for a company, but now that's kind of available for you. And that's going to become really, really interesting because I think we'll start seeing an impact of that on testing. Remember I said earlier, you know, we can't predict stuff that we can't predict, but this thing can. And um, I, I remember a talk from Mark Strebeck from Google um, in 2009, where he said that they ran some really interesting analytics um, that they use for spam filtering on their bug reports to see what kind of bug reports are spam what kind of bug reports are not spam, and to see if there's something interesting that they can conclude about kind of the code that's causing bugs. And in 2009, because of the volume of the code and the volume of the test that Google has, they were able to come up with some really interesting conclusions, like if a test has and in the name, it's likely to break more than it should. And then you can kind of figure out why and things like that. And they were trying to do some interesting stuff like, Mark, if a test is good or not, by saying that if a test fails and you fix the test, not change the code, then a test was bad. But if a test fails and you change the code, then a test was good. And they were kind of running analytics on stuff like that. But kind of, you know, that's Google. Google has tens of thousands of developers. How no, you know, God knows how many millions lines of code that they can evaluate. Um, we don't have samples like that. But we have GitHub. 
And for example, what MIT has done, there were researchers at MIT that actually ran some kind of weird machine learning AI on GitHub. And they created a system that automatically repairs standard bugs. Now, you know, this is not going to fix all problems ever, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing that's emerging now, where somebody was able to do this on million lines of code available on GitHub, and kind of some weird machine learning algorithm was able to conclude what kind of, you know, five types of bugs, I don't know, or, you know, and figure out what the typical solutions are and kind of start fixing them because they were able to see the fixes as well. And I think kind of this is very, very early days. You know, this thing might not be able to kind of spot and predict bugs in a general case or fix it, but five years from now, combined with all these kind of machine learning things, I think we're going to start seeing many, many more tools that as we start committing code, are going to say, hey, um, this kind of stuff triggers some weird pattern, and we had a similar bug six months ago, and kind of, oh, you know, it looks like you're writing a bug. And maybe you don't want to do that, or maybe you want to kind of start changing things a bit here, and it might not be able to fix problems, it might not even know why this is kind of a potential to have bugs there, but it's going to see, you know, statistically, it looks like this function is going to have a bug here. Now, check it, please. And I think what, 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 that's going to start giving us really, really interesting heuristics where, hey, fair enough, you know, I don't even know that this thing is going to be running on a Samsung fridge, but some other app on GitHub ran this on a Samsung fridge and it broke because of that, and we'll, we'll start having these things that propose areas of code where kind of we can start looking at threats and start looking at kind of those models that maybe there's no clear definition of what's wrong with it, but it's going to tell you, well, you know, maybe you want to do some exploratory testing on that. So I think that's kind of where tools are going to start making things easier for us in the future. We, we'll be able to do stuff that's incredibly expensive today, like UI, UI mutation testing on lots of different devices and lots of different kind of stacks, where that's going to become relatively cheap. Combined with something that's going to be able to extract relevant information from that, and then say, well, as a machine, I can't say whether this is right or wrong. You tell me. And if this is right, then I'll keep using that as a test. If this is wrong, well, you know, go and fix it. And kind of the, the second thing that's really going to happen is we'll start getting exploratory testing to happen on a much, much deeper level, where stuff that people do today as exploratory testing is going to be automated, and stuff that people do as exploratory testing in the future is going to be assisted by AI models and machine learning like this, so it can scale. So that, that's kind of where this is going. I said, most of these tools are out there today. They need a bit of sticky tape to combine. They need a bit of kind of massaging to really get the value out of. And if you don't mind kind of combining them, you can probably get a ton of these benefits already. If MIT researchers can run this on GitHub, so can you. Or you know, if you have a ton of code in your company, you have bug reports, you have commit logs, you have everything. Well, you know, figure out an AI model, use TensorFlow, or use the deep machine, distributed machine learning toolkit. It might kind of pop up with stuff you never expected to look at. And I think that's going to become more and more important for the future. So that's pretty much it. Um, I hope this at least kind of tickled your imagination. And if you do something interesting about any of this, please kind of drop me an email to tell me what you're doing. And um, kind of th that's about it. If testing is kind of an interesting topic for you, um, I, I write a lot about testing. One of my most recent books is 50 Quick Ideas to Improve Your Tests. You can pretty much find it anywhere online. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>